Hey there, singers, public speakers, and content creators. My name is Clay Collins, and this is the My Voice Mentor Podcast. I think this just might be the best intro bumper music of all time. In fact, I think my podcast just went up 10 notches just by this change alone. The name of the song is Still Rockin', and the band is David and the Giants. At the time of this recording, they had already been a band for 30 years, and this was recorded almost 30 years ago. We're talking about a career spanning over 60 years. So I've got a question for you. Do you think that your life, your talents, your abilities have a shelf life? Then I really believe today's guests are going to really inspire you. But before I introduce you to them, I want to make you aware of my five-day vocal boot camp. If you're interested in improving your singing, speaking, or just improving your voice in general, then I encourage you to take my free five-day vocal boot camp. All you've got to do is go to myvoicementor.com forward slash boot camp to get started. And please, if you're watching on YouTube, go ahead, hit that like and subscribe and the bell notification so that you'll be aware of new videos as they come out. And if you're listening on Apple Podcast or Spotify or wherever you listen, go ahead and like and review. It really helps me get the word out and allows other people to find and follow the show. All right, let me lay a little bit of a foundation. Today's guests are very special. They're very special to me personally, and I just really felt compelled to introduce them to you. I've actually been working on getting this interview set up for over a year. David and the Giants recently came to an event here in my area, and they graciously allowed me to spend a few minutes with them to interview them. So I, again, I can't wait to introduce you, but I want to lay a little bit of a backstory. So I want to rewind the clock back to 1980. I was eight years old. And if you can imagine being eight years old, walking into a little Pentecostal church, you might have an idea of what to expect. But what I experienced On this particular day, going to my mom's church, she had just started going to this little Pentecostal church in Richardson, Texas. And the last thing I ever expected to see or hear was a rockin', progressive Christian rock band in church. That was unheard of back then. This was prior to later bands that became popular like Striper and Petra and bands like that. There was nothing like that. So when an eight-year-old boy walks into this church and sees this band literally rock the house like nothing I'd ever seen, it marked me. I was forever changed. It had such an impact on me that I knew in that moment that music is what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. These guys have inspired me my whole life. And there's nothing more inspiring to me to know that Even today, the lead singer, David Huff, after having been touring, writing, producing, recording, he has his own recording studio since the late 70s, probably released and recorded over 40 albums. Truly a prodigy, truly a prolific writer, and he's still doing it at 80. I got to see them recently, and I haven't seen these guys perform since I was 12. And I can honestly tell you, they rocked the house, just like they did when I was a kid. They didn't miss a beat, and they didn't miss a step. So I really wanted to introduce them to you. I really can't wait for you to see them. But before I go to that interview, I just want to give you a little taste of what David Huff and David and the Giants are all about. Amazing. Electrifying. These guys really inspire me. I know they're going to really inspire you. So without further ado, let me introduce you to David and the Giants. 
So I'm here with one of my favorite groups, and I'm going to introduce you guys to them. In case you've never heard of David and the Giants, these guys are pioneers in, at the time, an unheard of genre. They actually created a genre. If you've ever heard of Christian rock, well, these guys are the unsung heroes of that because they were doing it before anybody did it. They did it before Striper. They did it before Petra. They were actually a decade ahead. And because God did a tremendous work in their lives, we're going to have them tell a little bit of the story. So guys, welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Along the left here, we've got David Huff, Keith Thibodeau, the drummer, the only non-family member, but I guess you are just kind of a adopted family member. We're going to hear a little bit of your story. And then over here, we've got the two twin brothers, Rayburn and Claiborne. Rayburn on keys, and I've already missed now. Is it Claiborne? Yeah, Claiborne and Rayburn, Rayburn on keys, Claiborne on bass. Well, whoever wants to go first, you go right ahead. Tell me a little bit about the history. I guess it really starts back with you in the 60s, doesn't it? Yeah, even well. Started that with me playing in a rock and roll band. And one day my brothers were, were talking about, you know, that they didn't know what they wanted to do, you know, as far as what they were going to do with life as an occupation. I said, well, why don't you play music? And so I got him a bass guitar and a guitar. And to my amazement, they stayed up. My mother said they'd be up all night long learning to play the guitar and learning to play the bass guitar. And this when they were in uh, seniors in high school. And so long story short, it was within, I would say, a year from that time that doors just opened for them to join the rock and roll band, David and the Giants. Of course, this was before the real David and the Giants <laughs> when we were born again. That's unbelievable. Well, it's crazy how even before you were saved, you still had a name that was kind of prophetic and where it was going to land. Isn't it interesting that God, even before you realize it, God mm. calls you to something? It's yeah. amazing. Yeah. And let me see if my Dave and the Giants trivia is correct. I believe the very first album that you pressed, the first single, Rock and Robin, is that right? Or was there something that preceded that? Actually, that was the first one. Now, that was... I've been trying to find it. I can't seem to find it. <laughs> and I, I, I've also been wanting to do the same thing, but it's somewhere out there. <laughs> but uh, that was before... Uh, the guys here, you know. Yeah. Um, Years before Michael Jackson recorded it, you recorded it. Most likely, yes. And on the flip side of that was I'll Always Love You. Now, was that the one later made famous by Whitney Houston or was that a different? That was different. Yeah, okay. Sure. Yeah. But that was an original song. Oh, th you wrote that one. Yeah. yeah, we definitely need to find that. Yeah. So that was 63. Yeah. That's a long time ago. Well, <laughs> That's a long time ago. So, Really, you had an entire lifetime from 63 to 77. At what point did you join the band, Keith? Well, I met the guys when I was 16 years old, and that was 1967. In Bullington, Mississippi, they were the house band there at the Vapors Club. So we kept in touch. And then when I was 19 years old, they saw me again, and I was playing in the band, and they were looking for a drummer, so they asked me to join them. And I think it was in December of 69 that I joined the rock band, Dave. I'm mm. not the Christian band. As the story goes, you were slided in as a sit-in drummer. You were the ringer, huh? Is that that? <laughs> and then the, the manager of the club talked to my manager for my little group that I had, a little high school group that was looking. So you were still in high school? Yeah, I was in high school. Wow. I, I shouldn't even have been in the club. You know, that's kind of, that's <laughs> And I didn't look like I belonged at the club either. Good. So, yeah. But uh, he asked the manager, the manager said to David, would you let this little guy sit in, you know, on drums? Because I'm trying out their group and he's going to you know, try out for them. And this nice guy over here, you or know, this gentle man we see over here says, let's, uh, let's, let's make sure this never happens again, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, he, but that was before I heard him play. Right, right. So he, he wasn't he wasn't hip to the idea at the time, and they were just kind of like smirking and saying, "Okay, we're gonna really get this little kid, you know, and get him out of here." So David asked me, "So what do you want to play? What do you know?" And I said, "Just play anything." You're like, "Oh, 
And so he goes, <laughs> okay, we'll play our hardest song. So they did. And I played it and impressed them enough that they thought I was pretty good. And David said, like, to the manager of the club, he said, who was that little guy? And the, and the manager said, Ricky, that on Lucy's show. Wow. So that's kind of my introduction to the band. Wow. And that was 67? 67. Yeah. So then there was kind of a turning point, I guess. So when did you guys become part of it? Was it right around the same time? We went to college for a year, and then we played a club. And then after the club, you know, uh, David, people he was playing with, um, somebody burnt the club down. The guys didn't want to go with uh, this guy that they felt like burnt the club down, uh, starting a club. And so David asked us to go with him because the rest of the guys didn't want to do it. So that's how we started playing with David. Still a secular band. Still a secular band. Yeah. So you came in, you came in making waves, and then you did again, I think. Then I came in 69. I got a call from David and he said, we're looking for a drummer and we'd love to have you play with us. And I said, wow. I'm fitting. It was a great opportunity. I, I was ready to leave town. I had gotten into drugs and things, and I was trying to just sort of depart from that area in Louisiana that I saw a lot of bad things happen to my friends and other things. So I looked at it as an opportunity to leave home for the first time. So that's what I did. I moved to Laurel, Mississippi, and we started playing in early 1970. The first place we ever played was a club called the Crazy Horse in New Orleans. And familiar that was my, with that was my I've been first, there. That was my first wow. gig. It's a blues joint, isn't it? You know, it was a it was a wild joint. That's, yeah, that's <laughs> I bet it, for a for a young guy, I guess it would have been. It was a big scene, you know, New Orleans scene back in those days. In fact, the band was known in New Orleans too, and we had some play on the radio stations there in New Orleans. And oh yeah, David could tell you more about that. And then you shook things up. Right around the time you had to go save your mom, but God had a different plan. Yeah. The Lord had mercy on me and delivered me. I was really messed up. I think of myself as handicapped during that time, mentally handicapped. And I was demonically oppressed and clinically depressed and suicidal. And about this time, my mom had been going to a, a Holy Spirit meeting in Louisiana where people were getting healed and filled with the Holy Spirit. And I went over there just, you know, taking my bets and saying, well, I won't like this, but whatever, you know, just a bunch of kooks, you know, of which I needed to be healed of all these mental issues that I had. So I got born again in 1974 and I was changed and Jesus came into my life in such a big, amazing way, like an atom bomb. And I went back to the guys and I said, you know what? There's more to the Bible than what men have led us to believe. And I said, let's change to a different style of lyrics, but keeping the same style of music, rock. Because I saw in Psalm 150 and 149 that we can praise his name with music. I mean, it's all in there. Loud, loud, loud symbols, you know? Yeah. Good. So they thought, you know, well, you'll get over this in a couple of weeks. And they were hoping. They were hoping I would. Because it was so weird to them, you know? But... David, actually, you wrote Glory Hallelujah, right? Yeah. And uh, after that, and it was kind of influenced by that. You were, I think you were trying to placate me. You were trying to just say, yeah, you know, we are Christians. We are we were raised Baptist and, you know. So between all of you, we've got Catholic. You I was raised, raised a Catholic. Raised Catholic. Yeah. You, you raised Baptist? Uh-huh. Baptist. Wow. And then. God filled you with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> the rest is history. Bless well, you know, I think you, you really touched on something, Keith, that, that I'd love for you to speak into a little bit. of. You were really introducing something that was unheard of. I can only imagine that you must have faced some resistance in the church because rock music in church seems like an antithesis. I mean, even today, that isn't a common thing, but in the 70s, like, how did you face what you felt like God was calling you to do versus... I'm sure the opposition that you were facing with that. Well, you know, when you know it's God, you just you just press toward whatever He opens up. That's where you go. And yeah, there was a lot of opposition. 
I can tell you many stories, and I know my <laughs> brothers and Keith can tell you some incredible stories, but God was for us. And it was prophesied before we ever got saved that there was going to be a ban to come to this Pentecostal church. And I'm not talking about just any Pentecostal church. This Pentecostal church was an ultra conservative church. I mean, where anything that sounded like anything except country, you know, that was off the evil one. And so God took us to the strictest church. Wow. The, the strictest pastor. Kind of like, like a fleece priest. before the Lord, right? Yeah. And two years before, it was prophesied this band was coming. So the pastor thought it was going to be a country music band. And to his surprise, we show up and you know the rest of the story. But we took all the opposition. And would we, would we go over it again? Yes, a million times because we're still standing. Well, you're still standing. You're still rocking. And I tell you what, you're either close to your 80th birthday or you just had it. Is it has it passed? Well, it's close. It's close. But it, don't let that number fail. <laughs> right. Absolutely. We don't have an expiration inside. date. No. no. Yeah. Inside, inside me, it's a volcano. I know it. I've seen it. I've seen it recently. And I've got one more question for you, but I know time is of the essence. I want to just go over here real quick to you guys. Because I know you guys are currently working on something you are sharing a little bit with me about what you guys have been working on together. You want to, who wants to talk a little bit about that? We started writing some songs back years ago. We was writing for David, our brother. You know, uh, we thought some of the songs from Psalms, David, you know, David in the Bible, then David to sing some of these songs. So me and Clever wrote 10 songs. And so we sent David a copy of the songs and David called me back and he said, uh, right when he said, those songs are not for me, but they're for you and Claiborne. And so from there, uh, I kind of thought, David's just, he don't like them, so he's just trying to. <laughs> now, he says that you're a hard band leader. Is that true? Sometimes. <laughs> well, I've gotten easier. You've, you. You've gotten a little softer. When he was a more secular band, it was really hard. I mean, yeah. But when we became Christian, be soft. God did a work in your heart then, huh? Yeah. Wow. That's I'm amazing. Still working. You're still working. Right? <laughs> right? Right. That's amazing. Well, I got one more question for you, but I want to make sure that if you guys can send me links to what you're working on, I want to put all that in the show notes. And so anybody listening, if you want to find out what's going on with Dave and the Giants, there's so much more we can talk about. And I'll probably have to like rope them in here in the future, maybe over Zoom so that we can continue this conversation because there's so m many places we could go. This is only scratching the surface, but they're actually doing a concert tonight. Tell a little bit about the the fundraiser that, that you're working on tonight. The lady that has us here is with Vision Productions. Elizabeth Waters and her husband Rick, they've always believed and trusted in us that we are men of God. And so there's many places that we go that financially they can't afford, you know, to pay you very much. And so we didn't go to them and say, hey, we want to come to Dallas and we want to do this fundraiser. We didn't do that at all, but we felt that God put it on their hearts, mm -hmm. you know, to bring us in here. But it just helps us down the road because there's so much left to do for David and the Giants because we have a story to tell this generation. Mm -hmm. I mean, we started out, you know, like 45, 46 years ago, almost. People are still the same Things have changed, but people, they still have a heart, and it's empty if, unless they have Jesus. And we were sent to reach out for the lost. That's who we are. That's who we will always be in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I got one more question. I know you guys got to go. But this is a voice podcast. I'm a voice coach, and so I deal primarily with singers. And so you are one of my examples that I hold up because... A lot of people, unlike other things that you can invest in your life, football, wrestling, you know, you've got a shelf life on those, but you have proven what I always say, you're actually in practice. You, your voice is as strong today. And I study, believe me, I've went and gone back to the recordings. I listened to your latest album all the way back to 1980. And there's not a practical difference in the way your voice sounds today from back then. Actually, I think it's got a little bit better. What do you attribute? your vocal strength to, because you're not supposed to be able to do what you're doing. And I agree with that. I don't supposed to be doing what I'm doing and my age, but 
I heard a voice, and this voice spoke to me in 1978. My two brothers and I, we shared this little three-bedroom upstairs at the recording studio in Laurel, Mississippi. I audibly heard the voice of God say it, keep on singing, keep on singing my song. And it got louder and louder, and when I woke up, he was still speaking louder and louder. And when I said, yes, Lord, the voice stopped. Mm. And I was dating my wife-to-be, and I said, Lord, what about Twala? And the voice said, marry her. So I said, well, by this time, I was sitting up in the bed. And so I waited for the Lord to say something else, and nothing happened. So I switched on my light. And I went over to my brother Rayburn, who was right there. We didn't have different rooms. It was all just one room. And so I, I went right where he was. I said, Rayburn, I said, God just spoke. He cut on his light. He said, what did he say, man? And I told him the same story that I just got to say. Unbelievable. I'll keep on singing. Well, I tell you what, we're going to leave it with that. Keep on singing. That's what I say. I think that is so good. If God's called you to do something, it's just for us to say, yes, Lord. So I want to just thank my friends. I'm just going to call you my friends. You don't barely know me, but I've been pursuing this guy for months, I, for years. He's been a gracious man. I've been a pest in his ear. Mm -hmm. uh, for, <laughs> for me, this has uh, been a, a tremendous gift. You guys have had such a tremendous influence on my life. I can't even tell you how much a, a little boy that you don't remember was watching you like a hawk just looking at everything you did it inspired me to do what I do and I wouldn't be doing what I am doing today if it wasn't for the influence that you guys have done and I know I'm just one of many I just want to express my gratitude to you gentlemen thank you for being who you are not only in your gifts but who you are as people I'm grateful to you and uh, I appreciate you spending a few moments with me today I love you we love you bro love you all right you're not a piss <laughs> well I know that that interview was as uplifting and inspiring to you as it was for me. It really did mark a full circle moment for me to be able to hang out with these guys and to share with them the impact that they had on my life. I really am so honored and excited to have been able to introduce them to you. These guys are still touring and they're available to perform at churches and events. So if you'd like to get in touch with them, the best way to do that is to go to davidhuff.com. I will leave links in the show notes. You're definitely going to want to follow them. All of their albums are available on iTunes and Spotify as well as YouTube. So you definitely want to check these guys out. They really are amazing. But in the meantime, I just want to leave you with a few thoughts and a few questions. First of all, as it relates to you, what mindsets did you have going into this episode about yourself, about your time frame, about your shelf life that you might have questioned in listening to these guys? How many of you thought that you have a retirement on your abilities or your talents and this episode helped maybe change some of those mindsets? And finally, what action steps are you going to take in order to preserve, cultivate, inspire the gifts that are within you? That's what this podcast is all about. That's what the guests that appear are all about, to inspire you to keep on writing, keep on speaking, and keep on rocking because this world needs your voice. And I wanna do all that I can to encourage you to let it out. So in the meantime, I'm so glad you joined me today. Please share this episode with somebody who needs the encouragement. And in the meantime, I will look forward to seeing you in the next episode.